Elena, would you like to go first? Sure. I'm Elena Mathia. I'm um, the CEO of a local firm, MTM. We provide transportation in the healthcare industry and also for the public transit industry. Nationwide, we have about 2,000 employees, just over 500 million in revenue. We were started in 1995 by my parents, and we just went through a generational um, transfer, that, so that's very exciting for our business. Um, personally, outside of the business, um, my husband Daniel Mathia and two daughters, Ariana and Amara, nine, well, actually 10 and 12, got that wrong. <laughs> Don't tell them I said that. Um, <laughs> I like to run and hike, and we found out we share hiking as yeah. a passion, and I also like to get out and rock climb when I can, and don't tell my insurance company that. Yeah. <laughs> Penny? Uh, good morning, I'm Penny Pennington. I'm the incoming managing partner of Edward Jones. Edward Jones was founded here in St. Louis in 1922 by Mr. Jones Sr., um, who, like uh, the HP folks, we still talk about Mr. Jones and Ted Jones as if they were in the room with us. Um, our firm uh, does, uh, help, helps individual investors, only individual investors, understand what's most important to them, uh, how they can financially achieve what's most important to them. We use an established process, our profession and our craft, to help seven million families, but we believe a 40 million addressable market in North America achieve financially what's most important to them. And we promise then to partner with them for the rest of their lives um, to help them stay on track. We, are, uh, we have 17,000 financial advisors. That is our distribution model and serving our clients uh, is the only model that we've ever had. And we're the largest firm in terms of number of financial advisors in our marketplace. We are a private firm. Uh, we are owned by the, the men and women who do the work of Edward Jones. Um, I, um, I am in transition with our current managing partner. Those of you in, in St. Louis know Jim Weddle well, um, learning literally at his side um, after a 42-year career at Edward Jones, nearly half of our existence. Um, learning from a leader like that is extraordinary. So not a whole lot of free time, but when I've got it, um, I'm, a, I'm a hiker, a cyclist. I love the, the culture and arts community here in St. Louis. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you. So our panel, I should have said, is, uh, is really about strategic ownership. So you hinted at this, Patty, but could you just take a minute to talk about what the ownership structure is at Edward Jones? Sure. Uh, our firm started as a traditional brokerage firm. Mr. Jones Sr. owned the firm along with a few other select partners. And when his son, Ted Jones, really took over the firm starting in the 1970s, um, Ted famously said, um, I'm a communist. I believe that the workers should own the means of their production. The difference is I'm going to make them buy it. <laughs> so still today, he, found, he, he organized a, a limited partnership structure back in the 1970s. And still today, that elegant, very simple structure remains. Um, we are owned by uh, roughly 480 general partners. And when we close our 17th limited partnership offering, this coming January, we'll have never, nearly 25,000 limited partners in the firm. So we believe strongly, we can prove it, that owners act differently than employees. They love the place, they are willing to give discretionary effort that drives the success of our organization, and we are bound together by our four core values. Um, the, the, uh, the ownership of the firm does change hands at book value. So the general partner's ownership changes hands at book value. And then we, every few years, we raise, raise limited partnership capital. This one, this raise will be about $400 million um, spread a, among those 25,000 limited partners. They are not voting partners in the firm. Uh, instead, they share in the profits of the firm. But as, again, Ted said, famously years ago, I don't need owners to share in the profits, I need owners to share in the work. So qualification for that ownership comes from um, doing the work the way that Ted asked us to do it. I just want to highlight real quick, and good, Elena, sure. that a lot of people talk about ESOPs as a very effective mechanism for getting ownership to the employees, and it is. It's a good program, it's a federally san sanctioned program. But there are other models, and, and it's important we talk about that too. There are other models of employee ownership which aren't under the ESOP structure that are also very effective too. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Lena? 
So our ownership structure, so we just changed hands from the first generation to the second generation. And so there's six children in the second generation, kind of a Brady Bunch family. My parents got uh, started their company after they got married, so my dad and my stepmom. So uh, there's four children that are not active in the business, so they have non-voting stock. And then the two active, my, myself and my sister, have the voting shares. And we think very similarly that the people running the business should have control of the business. And we're very committed to being privately held, um, family owned and operated. I love that chart that you showed because it's a similar uh, story to our main competitor who is publicly traded, started as a privately held company, went out, raised capital, private equity funding, and um, then went IPO or went public, not IPO, but went public. And I remember seeing the founder one time at a trade show, and he grabbed me and he said, hey, tell your parents congratulations. And I said, well, I'm sure they want to extend congratulations to you. I mean, huge success taking your company public. He said, no, they've created way more value than I would ever be able to tap into by staying private. And, it was, and it's been hard to stay private. You know, We've gone through downturns and through um, financially tough times, but it's all about having good partners and good advisors, and we got through those. And so I'm committed to doing the same thing that they did because it does create more value, and you are able to give more rewards to your employees by staying private. That's great, thank you. So I wanna kind of delve into what kind of creates this strategic advantage first. We'll start with Elena this time. Can you talk about what's the purpose of your business? The purpose of our business, am I still on? Yeah. Um, the purpose of our business is to really serve the individuals that we're helping every day. They're transportation disadvantaged. They're either impoverished, elderly, sick, um, cognitively delayed, and they really need transportation. Imagine not having a car. Um, imagine trying to get to work. Imagine trying to get to your health care appointment. And so we really care deeply about serving the transportation disadvantaged in the country. In the United States, we don't have great public transportation system. And not having a car can mean not having a stable job and not being able to provide your family and stay in that you know, poverty cycle. So our employees really are driven by that social mission. We're not a not-for-profit, but we have a very social-mindedness in our company, and then you know, extending that to our employees and allowing them to feel that they're not just working for a paycheck, they're working to serve individuals, gives them a lot of um, value. And then our job is to then serve our employees. You know, we really do have that servant leadership mentality. We want our employees to grow, prosper, build wealth, build talent. We uh, just yesterday, somebody said, oh, this great IT person, she's going to Worldwide Technologies. And I said, well, let's celebrate. You know, she's got a promotion and she's earned it and she's been a great worker. And so let's not be sad when our employees leave. We want, don't want them to leave, we want them to stay at MTM. But when they're successful, we're successful. Same question for you, Penny. Um, so our vision is to be the first choice of serious long-term individual investors in North America. And the way that we go about doing that, our, our mission is um, to meet with them uh, to build deep trusted relationships and you talked about deep trusted relationships a few minutes ago to understand what's most important to them and then build a customized strategy to help them achieve financially that we believe that what happens then is we make a difference in people's lives they themselves and their families become more confident and empowered about doing the things that are most important to them. We have a veteran financial advisor in Kearney, Nebraska, Jim McKenzie, and he said years ago, uh, his role, his uh, mission, is to create the most millionaires per capita in Kearney, Nebraska, than in anywhere in America. And he said, it's not about simply creating the wealth. It is because if we do that, the libraries, the hospitals, the school system, the cultural institutions in Kearney, Nebraska will be stronger because those families have achieved what's important to them for their families, and then they have discretionary wealth to make their communities even better. So we seek to do that today 17,000 times over, probably going to, to much bigger than that because as I said, 
we believe the, the addressable market uh, out there in North America is about 40 million families. So we got some runway. <laughs> so kind of related to this, Alina, when we talked the other day, you said you'd been at a conference <clears throat> and people were talking about what stock's going up and what's, I guess the last couple of days have been bad, but. <laughs> yeah, not this week, right? <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, you know, what's going up and what's the next hot tech thing and who's into what? And you made some point about, nobody was talking about the importance of like a reliable company, mm -hmm. you know, that employees can count on, that customers can count on, the importance of maturity in business. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about kind of that experience and how you reacted to it. Well, I think that it provides us a real unique opportunity to really focus on our clients and doing the right thing, you know, investing in the right avenues technology-wise, the right talent, the right people. When you're so focused on that, you know, stock price and raising capital, it, you get into, it's almost like that um, catching up with the Joneses or keeping up with the Joneses mentality, like this deal's going on and, oh, if I go do this private equity, I could do this roll up and then the company would be worth, you know, whatever with this much EBITDA and then, but what do you have? You know, what are you buying? What's that culture you're buying? What's, um, you know, what's the real strategic pur purpose of that? Because then you get lost in integrating those businesses and you kind of take the eye off the ball on the strategic goals of the company. So we really like to focus on organic growth. And we've been very successful in starting up four different companies or product lines. And we could have bought companies to do that, but we didn't have the capital, number one. So it wasn't really an option to start, you know, to go out and just buy it. We would have had to give up equity to go out and buy it. And then we would have somebody else in our boardroom telling us what to do that we don't really know. And they can tell you something in a nice sales pitch when they're you know, funding your business, right. but you don't really know who they are and you don't really know them. So we rather stay committed to our business, grow organically, be pragmatic, which was one of your points. And when we succeed, great. And, and then employees find that fun and they find that more interesting, I think, than worrying about, well, when you get rolled up, do I still have a job, right? So that's our, our goal. Great. So Penny, um, I guess there's a, you said there's a video, I think, that's being circulated around Edward Jones. Yeah. And, yeah. and something about Jeff Bezos. That's and right. So you, you, you referenced Amazon and Jeff Bezos earlier. Um, as part of this transition, this leadership transition that we're going through, I'm the sixth managing partner in nearly 100 years, so it, it's a big deal, and it's not about me. It's about um, refreshing of, of ideas and leadership, and it's exciting for the firm. And uh, everybody that I meet nearly grabs me by the lapels and says, Penny, what are you going to change? Everybody's really excited about what might change, though we can have long conversations about, uh, about the pace of change. Um, so it, it reminded me of this interview that started going around the home office. Y'all probably do this, right? Things, things grab our attention and we start sending it around among leadership. And there was this interview that Jeff Bezos did in, in a, a couple of years ago. And he said to the interviewer, he said, you know, the thing that people ask me all the time is, Jeff, in 10 years, what's gonna be different? He said, the thing that they never ask me is, Jeff, in 10 years, what's going to be exactly the same? And he said, Bezos said, if you can find out the truth, a truth that's never going to change, that's where you put energy and investment. It's worth it. It's durable. You know it's not going to change. So we've talked a lot about this. In the, in the midst of this transition, the opportunity to talk about um, pragmatic innovation and talk about our clients and dramatic changes in technology and what they see as value in this space. There's a lot that we've got to talk about there, but there are things that we talk about about what will never change. And the other, the other thing that's been very striking to me as I've been on my listening and learning tour the last four months is how much people talk to me about culture. I, I ask people in my first year as managing partner, what should I focus on? And they say, don't let the culture change. Do, do everything that it takes to ensure that our culture doesn't change. Then we have to specify what our culture is uh, because it's easy to get a smoke screen about the culture. The culture is our 
traditional business practices. No, it's not. Our business practices extend from our four core values, but they also have to look out into the, into the public forum to know what our clients value and what we need to be doing. What doesn't change at our, at our firm is the nature of two relationships. The first is with our client, and the second is the nature of relationship we have with one another. And Elena, you were talking about this, 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 this sense of community, even in a 45,000 person firm that comes in part because we are private, we're responsible to our clients and accountable to ourselves. Thank you, thanks. So let's talk a little bit about pace growth. Uh, what does pace growth mean to you? And then how does your being evergreen, uh, your ownership structure, enable you to grow in a way that would not be possible to say, for example, in a public company? So pace growth for us is keeping up with the market growth. So I don't think that you can say that you can grow slower than the market because then I think that means you're failing. So for us, pace growth was very rapid growth. Um, and so we had to be very open to taking risk, even though we weren't you know, we didn't have the publicly traded funding or the alternative funding. And that means, you know, keeping the money in your company and really being committed as a family to letting the business take care of itself. And in good times, then the family can take out cash to invest outside of the business because you do, the family should take out cash and invest outside the business so that during rough times, they don't need the business, right? So it's, it's, it's tough when you're growing as fast as we grew. We grew from 100 million to 500 million in about a three to four year period. And um, we had to manage out of our cash flow. So I might not be the best person to say what pragmatic growth is because we were pretty aggressive, but we had to be to you stay. Grew from, you grew from your own resources. Right, I we mean, you totally didn't outstrip bootstrap. the resources. And we, were you able to preserve your culture or do you find cultural strain at that growth rate? No, we really protected our culture. We talk about, we have five core values and it's in our walls and it's in all of our communications in the elevator when you go up. And people just love that a company has values and that, you know, it's, it sounds so, like an oxymoron, so right? right? <laughs> but in the transportation industry, I have to tell you, there's, we have a lot of competitors that don't have good values and don't have good ethics. And it's kind of an old industry and we're a new entrant. And so because we have those core values and because we're committed to being private, we get customers that align with our business values. We get employees that align with your business values. So if you're out there communicating what they are, then those people come to you. And some of your customers are state agencies yes. too, right? State agencies, public transit agencies. And they like the fact that agencies. you're reliable and you're gonna be around. Yeah. And yeah, I tell them all the time in the sales process, we're not going anywhere. We're gonna be here. We're not for sale. We have competitors that are for sale or that they're having ownership strife or management turn, churn. We have a great client, Austin. It's probably one of our favorite clients, super progressive city. And they love, I got somebody from Austin. Yeah. There's, there's a few. Austin weird. Yeah. <laughs> we, we fit in with them. You know, we're progressive and we, you know, we have a socialist mindset. Maybe we're not communist, <laughs> but we're social, socialist and we really believe in but that. You still love capitalism, right? Yeah. Well, you have to have capital right, to be a socialist. So the socialist countries have a lot of capital, right? So, you know, it's kind of well, an oxymoron. Put it together. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, no, that's great, thank you. Meandered around. Yeah, the, this pace growth thing, I've been trying to, to really be a student of that in, in the past number of years that I've been a leadership in the, fir leadership in the firm. And certainly, um, as I've been listening and learning from our former managing partners over the, the past several months, um, in 1980, our firm had essentially um, $10 million of capital and 220 financial advisors. In 2017, we have $3 billion of capital, all internally raised, and 17,000 financial advisors. So I'm not sure if that's paced growth. That, that is torrid growth, but it came, there, there was some lumpiness in that growth in terms of the, the, the number of financial <clears throat> advisors that we were growing. And again, the financial advisors is how we, how we serve our clients. Um, there were moments during that growth, in 1994 was one of them, when we did outstrip our supply lines. 
Um, we, were, we were growing and training so fast that our training program broke down. And our managing partner at the time, uh, John Bachman, recognized this was not good for clients. It was not good for what we were trying to achieve. He shut the thing down. And a, a number of leaders went out to Pear Marquette and they rebuilt the, the training program over a nine month period of time. And then they, they cranked it back up. So um, th this idea of, of paced growth, I think Elena, you're right. It, it, um, there's a certain amount of opportunism and a certain amount of requirement of growth that then um, requires, a, requires capital, requires ma major calls about capital. I was talking to John Bachman several weeks ago and I wanted him to tell me what it was like to, do, to make a bet the farm decision. And one, there, there were two of those decisions where we essentially spent the equivalent amount of our capital both on communication systems. They were very innovative communication systems at the time. In fact, they were purpose-built. And uh, the, the, two, the two critical leaders were Ted Jones and John Bachman. And I said, what is it like to bet the farm? And he said, Penny, we didn't really even think about it. We knew if we didn't do it, that we wouldn't be here. We knew if we did it wrong, we wouldn't be here. So we had to do it, and Ted's name was on the door. It was him who was gonna make the decision. So we made that decision. I, can't, I, I don't know as a leader if I'll have that kind, that would be a $3 billion decision. I, I mean, I, I, I can't quite fathom it, but as I think about the audacity, the courage, the fact that it was a private firm and was so closely held enabled these two visionary leaders to, to make that kind of decision and then, uh, then, then uh, enable our growth over time. And, and so pragmatic innovation for us is how do we continue to do that? That's great. And you said something that was interesting is you said sometimes the growth is lumpy. Yeah. That's yeah. hard if yeah. you're a public company. Oh. Nobody likes lumpy growth. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't great for us either. So, so we, we, have, we have three peaks of growth and, and there, are, there are client measures and there are financial advisor measures. And there was one year that we grew, it was during the financial crisis, that we grew by one financial advisor. And we had one month in that year where we were just barely profitable. And man, that was... That was scary and maddening, and then this year we'll grow by. But you laid off about a quarter of your staff. Uh, we laid off for... no one. <laughs> Jim Weddle said, "Here's yeah. what we're going to do." Yeah, I mean, 50% of our operating expense is people, right? It's a people-intensive business. Jim said we're going to cut 10% of our operating expenses. That meant we had, without laying anybody off, that meant we had to cut 20% of our non-people operating expenses. And we came together, we did it, we exceeded that, we didn't lay a single person off. Awesome. That's, uh, that's, that's what's, awesome. where, what you're able to do, right? Yes. When, you're, when you're thinking about your clients and you're thinking about your people. You don't kill your culture for a penny a share. <gasps> no. You don't do it. All right, so um, putting compensation aside, let's talk about people first. And tell a story, just a, a meaningful story of something you've been able to do for your employees or for an employee that might not have been possible if it wasn't your company with your ownership structure and your value, something you're very proud of. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share? Yeah, I'll tell a, a, a sort of a recent one. And, and I do want to say this. Um, we do not believe that our associates come first. We believe our clients come first. Our first core value is the interest of our clients come first. We believe that with that ethos, the, the mission orientation of the firm enables all of us as associates and leaders to come together to, um, to progress that, that vision. So we, we very, um, very publicly say that our associates don't come first, our clients do. Um, and and that, put, that puts us in, in the back seat then, looking out the front window about what is, what is value to them. But I, I think the, the, the partnership structure, the, the ownership structure of the firm enables this a little bit. Um, 
we are, we are in every nook and cranny of North America. So when disaster strikes um, and enterprise, there's so, many th there's so many things to talk about with the enterprise experience. I know some of you got that experience, but um, those leaders talked about how they don't have to coordinate from home office what's gonna happen to help their associates and clients. People just pile in and they do it. They've, they've got a playbook, they know what happens, they know that they're gonna need help at some point, so they're, they're there to help one another. Um, w w several years ago, we formed a disaster relief fund. We give money to the, the Red Cross and that kind of thing for the communities that are affected by various disasters. But we said, well, people keep asking us this, let's form a disaster relief fund, fund inside the firm. And we did, and it's, it, you, you can do a payroll deduction and it's for that particular disaster. Um, and whatever money is raised is then given out by a small committee of people, um, including associates who are on the ground there. And so every disaster that comes up, we've got you know several hundred thousand dollars that come into this disaster relief fund. But, but even more importantly, those markets come together and they just go help each other. Uh, all the trucks, all the water, uh, they, I had a bunch of Louisiana financial advisors tell me the other day, um, precisely how they go in and rip out drywall after a flood. And they've got a system down where they can get contractor, because they know how to rip out drywall, mm -hmm. they can get contractors in for their clients and our associates more quickly than anybody else because the, dis the, the demolition is already done. I, it's just, it, it's th this community of care around clients and each other comes as a result of, I believe, of being private, yeah. taking care of each other. Well, it definitely seems like more hurricanes are in our future <laughs> present, right? So we have a lot of experience, um, very similar story, actually, and I think it goes to that story of having a great employee culture. We, um, last year, we, we have a large office in the Houston market, so when they had the hurricane there, first of all, we're focused on helping evacuate people from hospitals and nursing homes and we are part of often the third you know first responders and uh, you know maybe you saw Houston moving all of their buses that wasn't us but you know that'd be something they moving them to high ground and, and away from the area so that would be something if we were in that market we would be doing but we actually had a very large customer service center there and so our whole company um, did the payroll deduct and donated to our employees that were affected. You know, people lost cars, they lost their apartments, and some really heart-wrenching stories for those families. And, you know, those, that's just one thing that can just start that poverty cycle. So our ability to help there is, you know, is profound. But I actually have one story of an employee that just breaks my heart. She um, lost her husband in an accident, which she was in years ago, years before she joined MTM. She's the most lively employee we have, has the best attitude. She's in the DC market and she called me one day, just, I couldn't even understand what she was saying. Her house had burned down. You know, her son had put something on the stove, went down to, in the basement to game and came back and that whole house was on fire. I said, well, was anybody hurt? Nobody was hurt, but she had lost, you know, absolutely everything. And second huge tragedy for this person and the whole company rallied around her and we really gave a very significant donation to her so that she could get restarted. And she called me a year later and said, Elena, I want you to know I bought my first house. And, you know, nothing is more exciting than when your employees reach a milestone like that. So that was a very... She called you, Elena. I mean, yeah. she, she called you when she when she was in trouble and she called you yeah, when she, she had this major milestone, yeah. right? So that, that, that I, there, I think there's something too about um, the founder, the founder's family, um, knowing that she can come to you and say, I need help and, I, and, and thank you. I think, that's, I think that's amazing too. Penny, you're amazing. She just picks up <laughs> She's good at that. her talk all day. <laughs> you see why she's getting the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, do. I do. Good choice. So um, you, you talked a little bit about pragmatic innovation. You know, how, uh, how does your ownership allow you to innovate, uh, you know, think about, you know, very long planning horizons, invest perhaps in time frames that might, others might not be comfortable with? Um, talk a little about that. 
Well, for, for us, that, I mean, th and, and I've been very open with Dave, one of, the, one of the reasons that I was intrigued about becoming a member of Tugboat is this, this community of innovators, <laughs> of, of companies that are, that are growing rapidly, that are thriving, that are in, enmeshed in new ideas. We're nearly 100 years old. We have one business line. We have one way of doing things. It, it's easy to say this way is the right way and we've got this 40 million addressable market and hey, the way that we do things is we're, we're good. Oh my gosh, that, that, that's the scariest place to be. So thinking about uh, the fact that we do have access to capital, we're about to raise $400 million. And by the way, I can say all this even as a private company about what we're gonna raise and what we're gonna do with it um, here's the, 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 the little bit of the other side of that. Because of how large our partnership is, we are a filing company. We have to file with the SEC, 10 Qs, 10 Ks. Everything's out there for our clients, our competitors, our associates to see because of the size of the partnership. Um, we kind of like, we, we've, we've turned it to our own advantage because we think that there's a lot of transparency with our clients and our associates about who we are. But, um, so we're about to raise $400 million of capital. What are we gonna do with this capital? We can do all kinds of things with this capital. What's the right thing to do, given our business model, given the way that we are somewhat enigmatic about how, how we serve our clients? What's the right way to do it? What's the right pace with which to do it? Um, should we go spend $200 million on a new mobile app for our clients? Probably so. We've never done that before, so how do, we, how do we go about doing it? So using the capital wisely, pragmatically, but innovating at the pace of our clients. One of my, um, one of my fellow leaders said, Penny, how long are we going to make our clients wait for dot, dot, dot? Um, the type of value that we can deliver to them. We've, we've got to make some innovative decisions about our business practices and especially our technology. For MTM, um, we have to, you know, right now respond to the changes in the market. You know, you've got Uber and you have Lyft and you have that real-time experience and get to watch the car come in to pick you up. And so now that's the customer experience requirement, right? And so we have a much different delivery model. We have a fragmented network of transportation providers serving all different levels of needs and modes all throughout the country. And there are all different levels of, you know, IT, uh, you know, acuity. So we have to build a strategy that doesn't mimic what Uber and Lyft does, but actually serves our market and meets our needs. And plus think about our end consumer who might have a smartphone, might not. Um, and so we have to develop a technology solution that is much more difficult and different than what consumers are used to. But our clients are able-bodied consumers. They're people who fly in planes all over the country and get the Uber and the Lyft, right? So educating them about how it takes us longer to do it right, to do it with high trust certification, you know, we've got HIPAA data, you know, it's a whole yeah. layer of regulation and complexity also to deal with. So, um, but we have to respond. And we, so we literally the last two days um, were in all day meetings doing our budget process for next year and going through what are, what should we be spending our money on? What is going to drive our market share? What do we have to do to keep the lights on? What do we have to do to protect security and data? So not unlike any, any business. I mean, it's pretty standard and what resources do we have available? And then if we don't have enough, then are we going, how are we gonna raise that money or how are we gonna delay it and, and whatnot? So I, I don't think it's anything unique or different other than that we're not gonna just put lipstick on a pig you know, we're gonna do it the right way. We're gonna invest the right way. We're not gonna make up a story just to have a market story. We're gonna do what's right for the business. Yeah, I think that's the important thing is that it allow, it might, in hearing what you said and you said earlier is it allows you the opportunity to, um, to really get underneath what you really need to do yeah. because constraints actually 
drive creativity, mm -hmm. you know, and the opposite would be is you raise a lot of capital, you do another $350 million financing, you know, just came in from the vision fund and you suddenly look around and all your vice presidents say, I can spend $5 million. I can oh, spend yeah. $10 million. And everybody, yeah, you can spend it, but and you lose track of what a dollar is even worth. It's, it's a, it's a very manic type environment. So it may seem like, um, it may seem like it has limitations, but also has tremendous strengths well, because of that. It goes back to the prioritization of what you should do. Right. You can do everything, but will you get anything done? And no matter how much cash you have, you right. can never do everything. Because no. there's always something else you can do. Right. right? Okay. Let's ask some questions. Over here. And while he's walking over us uh, for a quick answer. So recession's probably Thank coming you. someday. They seem to do that at some point. It's been a while. Um, are you scared? Are you optimistic? How do you think about recessions? Well, I, I'm optimistic because for us, a downturn's great because when you do have new entrants or all this new tech and all this fervor going on in the market, you know, some of that might just go away. And so we, we're actually looking forward to that moment. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, for us, the, a recession and a downturn has a direct impact on our clients' ability to financially achieve what's most important to them. So for us, it's a real focusing mechanism. Um, we're, our investment philosophy is a long-term investment philosophy. So we earn our keep in a lot of respects in how we serve our clients. When they start to get wobbly in the knees, um, we got to be there to, to help them stay the course and remain confidence. And then when it comes to home office leadership around that, that's critically important. When it comes to what it does to our, our economics, um, it's all a focusing mechanism. So in a, yeah, in a strange way, we kind of, we, we, we know it's going to come, so we might as well look forward to it. I was at, at um, I was at J.P. Morgan yesterday, and Mary Erdos is the CEO of the um, of their wealth management and asset management area, and she um, she tells a story about um, someone giving her advice years ago that if you can't get out of it, get really really into it. Yeah. So that's the way we feel about you know when when market downturns come, we get really into it. Thank you. Uh, obviously, when things are great, things are great. And if you're flush with cash, things are wonderful. And it's easy to stay true to who you are. Um, but if you're in a situation, if you're not, in your, both of your cases, I'm not sure how much you rely on debt to fund your, your, your needs. Uh, but to the extent that you do, how do you resist pressures to not stay true to who you are, you know, when your lenders or other funders or people who supply you with, with capital, when they come to you and they say, look, I really think you should be doing this, and you're saying, no, this is who we are. How do you resist those, those pressures? I can talk about that. In 08, we went through, um, we entered a really bad contract right when the market downturn happened. Our bank had been a major buyer recently um, at that point of a mortgage lender and they were in severe um, credit issues, so they had to get rid of bad credit. We were in that. We were the credit they asked to leave, and that was the most stressful time in the business that I can remember. And you know, we could have gone out and raised mezzanine debt. We could have gone out and got private equity debt, um, but that's the worst time to get it when you're in a bad spot, right? You don't, you're gonna give away a ton of your company if you do that. And uh, I remember my dad and I just talking over Christmas while everybody's opening presents. You know, we're in the back corner, you know, trying to solve this major business crisis and not let the family know, hey, you might not get those kinds of gifts next year. <laughs> um, and that's when we got really creative. And because my dad was such a networker and um, really talked to people all the time, he knew of some alternative financing with state tax credit, which we were a great. Um, candidate for since we go in and we set up a state contract and we hire a lot of people and a lot of jobs we were able to tap into that kind of alternative financing and so I think that's just um, advice to always be out and about and talking to people and learning from other people you don't know when you might need that advice and if you stay insular in your business you're losing opportunities to learn from other people so tugboats a great example of getting together and learning from each other so that you can tap into help when you need it. Next question. I go here. 
I'm sorry, wait, let's get him first and we'll get you next. Is that okay? Can you speak a little bit about, um, you know, if you have employees that maybe aren't embodying the culture that you guys have developed, how do you treat them humanely in order to either get them on board or remove them from the organization? I'll I'll talk about that a little bit. When your when your culture is really strong, um, who was uh, Enterprise said, and we we don't love this because it's said about us. But Enterpr somebody on the stage Wednesday said it's kind of a cult around here. <laughs> the the culture is so strong that there is a certain amount of selecting in and selecting out. Uh, we have 45,000 people at our firm, so there's a spectrum of, of, of people and their motivations for being a part of Edward Jones. But I think, I, I think that there, there is a, there's a commonality that is based on the culture, the core values, the fact that clients' interests come first, that the place was built for our clients, not for us. And leadership talks about it over and over and over again all the time. So our, our, um, our leadership and management structures are built on that. We are in, in the field, we are led and managed by 289 volunteer leadership teams. And they do it because somebody did it for them and because they are part of, part of our culture is to help others be successful. So there is a, there's a certain amount of selecting in and selecting out. Um, I was at a, I, we, we had the Disney Institute come in to speak to a recognition conference a few weeks ago and um, they, they said, we never fire anybody, we just help them find their happy place somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty good, right? Uh, so so there, there, is a, there is a certain amount of, of fit with the organization. When we hire somebody into home office, uh, it is notoriously long. It can take months interview panels that go on for days. I mean, they, they meet people all the way to the, to the role of the managing partner because it's so important for them to feel comfortable with what they're, what they're coming to and for us to feel comfortable with that. And by the time it's all over, they say, oh, now I get why this took so long. I would echo all that. I mean, we're pretty rigorous in using the assessment process, um, really understanding why people have succeeded and failed in the past, and so really looking for those attributes in our candidates. You know, the biggest one for us is collaboration. We have we are always in huge projects and startups, and you you have to be somebody who wants to work on a team. You cannot be, um, you know, the negative Nelly in the group. So, and similarly, if there's we hire and fire for culture. So if we there, unfortunately, there is a bad fit then you know we've already coached that person many times we've had many conversations we've gone through the assessment we share our, i share my assessment with my team you know i say where are my development areas and then that way they can share their development areas you know you establish that safe place we're all here to grow we're all on our own journey nobody's stagnant but if you're not working on that journey then then you're self-selecting out and I think that's super critical and very slow to hire. It might not be the, you know, what you can do in this tight, tight job market, but I remember one time we were interviewing somebody for a very high level position. And after the third interview, he called people in culture and just said, I, I can't stand your process. It's too long. And then we said, great, thank you for selecting out of our process. <laughs> and I remember he, he said one other thing, which I just still to this day, I think it's really funny. He did not like that we gave him coffee in a paper cup. And so we thought, well, great. You really don't fit our culture. <laughs> so I, I think the hiring slow is probably one of the best things you can do. You know what, what you're talking about, Elena, and the vulnerability of leadership to share what their skills and competencies are and then what they're working on. That says so much about a culture and welcomes people into a place to be the very best that they can be. So this, this is, it's a segue for me to talk for just a minute with that question about diversity then of thought and perspective when you're creating a culture that's really strong and 
an observable, you know, enterprise said, use the word cult, and that has been, that has been used about Edward Jones as well. And I get where people are coming from, um, but there's a dark side to that. The dark side is, wow, I don't look like them. We know what, what right? What, we know what I'm talking about there, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the way that our industry has looked has been the traditional majority for decades. And so have we set ourselves up to be a place where people say, well, I don't belong there, either as a client or as a really talented associate. So really specifying what we mean by our culture and the fact that when, when we're talking about the success of the organization, we know that we need to enable the success of a wide array and perspective of people. But to Elena's point, collaboration, client first, building relationships, those competencies are what the culture then and the, the talent needs to be built around. So that we don't get confused about, oh, you got to look, you got to look just like us yep. to have a, a successful career at our firm. And if you want to get to here, then you have to be purposeful about it. Yeah, for sure. Not just for accidental. Sure. Mm -hmm. Elena, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Penny, thank you. Thank you. These are amazing women. Thank you. Amazing women. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>